So the future really is in thinking about fitness for duty assessments. I can think of no other time than the pandemic where that has become so important because the same issues around whether or not you're too sleepy to work are related to whether you're too sick to work. In the earlier SARS epidemics, you know, we had nosocomial transmission that was documented in the literature of physician trainees coming to work sick, you know, and staff because of this high, you know, misplaced moral obligation on the professionalism of working um, over taking care of yourself, even when it puts patients and others at risk. Hi folks, I'm Dan Dworkis and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. All right, get ready for episode 51, where our co-host, Dr. Andrea Austin, dives in with Dr. Vinny Aurora. Now, Dr. Austin will introduce Dr. Aurora in just a minute, but Dr. Aurora is a physician, a scientist, and an absolute treasure trove of knowledge on the subject of sleep and on the subject of sleep and the link between sleep and performance under pressure. So this fits really squarely into both the prepare and recovery parts of our prepare, perform, recover, and evolve cycle. Before we jump in, a reminder of two great ways to get more involved with the Emergency Mind Project if you like what you're hearing. First, you can join our newsletter. It's called Knowledge Under Pressure, and you can find that at emergencymind.com slash sign up. The other way is you can read the book, which is called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. It's available at Amazon, or you can find that at emergencymind.com slash book. Finally, don't forget to like, comment, and share the podcast because that really helps us get these messages out to as many people as possible. All right, all that said, let's jump into this episode. I hope you enjoy. Hi, this is Andrea Austin, your co-host on The Emergency Mind. I recorded this podcast back in July of 2021 with Dr. Vinny Aurora. Dr. Aurora is Dean of Medical Education at the Pritzker School of Medicine at University of Chicago. In addition to being a dean, she's also an internal medicine physician and practices clinically as a hospitalist. Dr. Rora is an expert in sleep, or what I would really like to say, the lack of sleep among physicians. While our audience at the Emergency Mind is much broader than just physicians, I think this is a really important conversation because physicians are supposed to be the people that we turn to for the most accurate information about health. And a lot of times doctors say the right things, but we're not doing the right things when it comes to sleep. Our system is founded and perpetuates sleep deprivation, even though we tell our patients they need seven to eight hours of sleep. This podcast, our community of the emergency mind is dedicated to improving your performance under pressure. The truth is we can't get there without sleep. So buckle in and enjoy this conversation about how we can do better with sleep. Dr. Aurora, thank you so much for joining us on The Emergency Mind today. Uh, Thank you for having me and uh, please call me Vinny. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So tell us a little bit about how you got interested in sleep and what your journey's been on understanding how it impacts resident performance? Wow, that question takes me back. So I um, trained, you know, two decades ago, and I am a first generation student of medicine, you know, in my family. And I was at Wash U uh, for medical school in St. Louis, and I was on my first rotation on neurology. And I don't think that anyone ever really prepared me for what a call night as a medical student, even at that that end, was like. And I remember being in the ER admitting a patient with my resident, and it was three in the morning, and I was just exhausted. And I was like, how do you do this? This is so hard. And my resident was like, didn't anyone tell you this was what it was like? And I was like, no, nobody told me. And that was sort of what what got me interested in this this idea of sleep. And then I revisited this later as a resident, obviously, you know, you know, going through all these different call schedules. Um, I was an intern and I helped 
design, um, you know, helped give input on one of our call systems in internal medicine. And at that time, we didn't have an 80 hour limit. We also didn't have the maximum shift, um, you know, a requirement. Um, and so you just stayed until the work was done. And so, you know, when, you know, a, a good handoff was no handoff. And so you were just there. And I remember, um, we had um, some, you know, car accidents, we had, you know, drowsy driving accidents in our residency. And that in inspired a variety of policy work on um, how to ensure that residents had a safe ride home and advocacy so that we could get a taxi cab fund. It still continues today for the whole institution, a ride share fund for, for tired residents, um, as well as thinking about, well, what, what is needed? Um, and then when I was a chief resident, I was, uh, you know, around the time of 2000 and one was right around the time where we were um, implementing the new duty hours. And it was so polarizing. I did my chief residence grand rounds on this topic of resident sleep and performance and the need to restrict resident duty hours. And it was, uh, you know, it's a moment in time where, you know, it it doesn't sound as controversial now, given everything that we have in medicine that, that we need to do around issues around, you know, racism and gender equity and improving health equity. But at that time, this was the the topic du jour, you know, which is how long should residents work and people, you know, the residents on one side and the faculty on the other, um, a variety of, um, you know, opinions in between. And so that's how I got interested in this topic um, was really more from a medical educator lens of having to deliver a schedule and then setting up a study, you know, so how come there was no research? And so why, why couldn't we do a more rigorous study? So I set up one of the first studies looking at um, the impact of a nap schedule to um, allow residents to get a little bit of sleep on those marathon shifts, shifts to see how they did. That's fascinating. So with that, that study, what did you find out about naps? Well, it was really interesting. Um, it was actually published alongside an article in, about truck drivers. And so we did not call it a nap initially. And so I mentioned that because, you know, that we, we avoided the term nap and talked about it as a protected sleep, protected sleep period. And we thought, thought that was important because naps sort of infantilized the issue. And, um, and as, as you can imagine, there were people that were like, oh, nap time for residents, you know, and we didn't want to, you know, get into that sort of culture battle. But because it was coming out in the issue of Annals of Internal Medicine and the truck driver study was about naps, it sort of got, you know, you know, the editor sort of packaged it up as nap studies. What we found was actually really interesting, which is that even a little bit of sleep, an hour more sleep with this protected schedule, translated into improved sleep and fatigue objectively for the residents. And the fatigue actually was, uh, the fatigue benefit was so great that on a validated scale, it was as if you went from being post-call to feeling refreshed on call. It was a one point difference in scale after a marathon shift, after the uh, 30 hour shift. Um, however, um, and there was no difference in patient outcomes. And so that, that those were all positive, you know? The, the challenge though, is that people at that time were really reluctant to use the protected sleep night float person because they felt that they would have to sign out all their patients. So again, it's we work in complex systems. And so one intervention, one place, you know, is going to affect other things. And so people felt like, well, I don't wanna, I, I could, you know, literally the quote was, I could sign out and get more sleep, I know that, but I don't want someone else taking care of my patients, you know, um, because I want to know what happens to my patients and I'm concerned that something is going to get dropped. And so at that time, there was no handoff education. There was no standardized handoffs. Um, and so what you saw is because we didn't, ha we hadn't fixed the handoff part of the equation, people were reluctant to use the intervention. So it was only used 22% of the time. However, even though it was only used 22% of the time, we saw this benefit on sleep. So what my thought is it could have been actually greater benefit, uh, but we just didn't, you know, again, it was real world conditions. People are going to, um, you know, adopt interventions, just like taking medications, right? You can have an amazing vaccine for COVID, but the effectiveness of that vaccine in real world conditions depends on people taking the vaccine. And so it's very similar. It was, you know, we had this great intervention, but we depended on people to take it. And if the perception was that my patients were going to suffer or that I was going to miss out, 
you know, then then of course you wouldn't get the the benefit. Having said that, times have changed, and so this was a long time ago. And I think handoffs have come a long way, culture has come a long way, and and fortunately scheduling has come a long way. So we are moving in a direction that honors these types of um, you know better schedules, if you will, to promote sleep. So I'm going to say a few statements that I think to be true about sleep. And then I want your input on if I've got anything wrong. So my understanding with sleep is the average adult needs seven hours a night. Some variants, but most of us are in between seven and eight. You got it right. Seven to nine hours. Some people may need a little bit more. Obviously, that's the average adult. And, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you happen to have a sleep disorder, you know, you might be requiring more or less. You know, there are some people that are classified as short sleepers, very few. But um, but yes, in on average, seven to nine hours of sleep is needed for healthy adults. And I really learned this when I was on a military deployment. And I think this is a really interesting story and kind of an experiment that our listeners could try to figure out how much sleep they actually need. Before I had gone on my deployment, so I was, I think I was two years out of residency and I thought that I needed eight or nine hours of sleep. And the reason I thought I needed that was if I ever had a time where I could sleep, that's how much I slept. So what happened on deployment was actually really fascinating. I was in Iraq and I was mainly taking care of Iraqis that were involved in IED explosions or gunshot wounds. And it just so happened that most of the injuries happened during the day. And for the first time in well over a decade, I usually slept all the way through the night and I wasn't doing night shifts. It just, our schedule favored uh, being busy during the day. There was maybe in three months, I got woken up twice in the middle of the night. So after three months, I started sleeping seven hours a night. So I think what that illustrates, right, is that I finally caught up on my sleep debt and got down to what I actually need. First of all, that's an amazing story. And thank you for your service uh, to our country. And uh uh, and I'm I'm grateful that you were able to get some sleep. I, uh, not knowing enough about the situation, I would worry that there would be a lot of stress and anxiety and you know other things that would be weighing down on, on those that are serving in the military. Having said that, um, one interesting thing to note is that um, your experience is you know while unique to the military, it's not unique to Americans where we are basically walking around with chronic sleep deprivation and sleep debt. And so um, my one of my mentors, Dr. Ev Van Cotter, who's a, you know, a giant in the field of sleep and um, especially metabolic health, uh, I remember her watching her on 60 Minutes describing the following scenario, which is when you see it, when you're on a plane and you see the plane take off, look around and see how many people fall asleep in broad daylight. And this is not an early morning flight or a red eye, just in the middle of the day. And you, you know, you will probably recognize that you do see people falling asleep on the plane. That's a common activity, and um, and that indicates that there is some element of sleep deprivation, you know, chronic sleep debt that people are paying off, that they can fall asleep that easily in an airplane. And um, and I would challenge you that there are times when you're bored out of your mind and you'd like to fall asleep, but you can't. And so um, and so there is definitely this idea that. Um, we all have elements of restricted sleep. You know, I mean, I'm a parent of young children, and so I I don't have the quote unrestricted sleep schedule where I can actually find out when when I would like to wake up. Um, and so so I you know when when I'm on the plane or when I can catch catch, catch a little cat nap, I am because I am operating in that in that um, in that sleep debt zone. Um, I know that residency is like that, and I'm sure that elements of people's lives are like that. Um, And that's something that's really important to recognize is that um, people don't realize how tired they are often until they have that first restorative recovery sleep that's unrestricted. You know, so you often hear people being like, oh my God, I went on vacation and I got so much sleep, you know, and I'm, and often they're they're like, I was exhausted that first day, you know? So it's like you let yourself be exhausted because you were so tired and, and, um, and running on adrenaline often. Yeah. I had that experience too. When I finished my last ICU rotation during residency, 
it was the hardest ICU month I had ever done. Just the hardest calls. You wouldn't get a wink of sleep. And it was Q3, you know, every three days, these really long shifts. And my husband and I got to Maui. And the first three days, I slept 11 hours. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And my husband would say like the level of, I was so, I was sleeping so deeply that he was honestly concerned at times. Yeah. I was so hard to arouse. And I, I just think back to that time. Um, and I guess what I, what I'm wondering about, and like now you're a Dean of a medical medical school and obviously, you know, you're a leader in medical education. Mm -hmm we don't allow pilots to do this, you know, yeah. like pilots have mandatory rest. We would never get on a, a, a cross country flight allowing a pilot to have been up for 30 hours, but it is a very routine thing that if you are a trauma patient rolling into a trauma bay at seven in the morning, your trauma surgeon may have been up all night. How did we get here and where are we going? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, just a note about your 11 hour sleep, which is magical. Um, you know, uh, recovery sleep is is deeper sleep. That's when you get that deeper sleep and you get the restorative sleep. And um, it usually takes up to two nights of recovery sleep uh, to pay off your sleep debt of, of one night of sleep deprivation. And so, so that's why, you know, you sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, I'm exhausted, you know, uh, and then they're still exhausted because you're, they're paying off their sleep debt. What's interesting about medical education and residency in particular is, um, you know, if we think back to the founding fathers of residency training, if you will, the first modern surgical residency training was at Johns Hopkins Hospital, where I happened to go to college and studied history of medicine. So, um, you know, William Halstead, who's the father of, uh, of, of the modern surgical residency, also happened to be a cocaine addict. And so, you know, the, the hours that they developed in this model and why is it called resident while well, you slept in the hospital and it was largely men and they were not forbidden from marrying. And so they, you know, stayed there. And so, so again, it has not, not exactly uh, what you would call, you know, a, a focus on well-being and wellness <laughs> that uh, that we would be required to to meet from ACGME today. And so, starting with that as the base, um, you can understand that if you if you start with that, you know, then a cocaine. Yeah, addict. exactly. <laughs> Coming up with the sleep schedule. Wow, this is the first time I'm hearing yeah. that, and it explains exactly. So much. Well, it's even you know, little, there's also other perverse incentives, and so. You know, residencies proliferated um, actually in the, you know, I want to say in the in 80s, 70s, you know, when Medicare started paying for residencies. And um, and so what happened is a lot of hospitals set up residencies because they were, you know, in, a, in effect, cheap labor, you know. So you could set up a shingle, you know, have a resident and you would get paid by Medicare to pay their stipend. And, and there were very few rules at that time around governing residents. And in fact, there were so few rules around supervision. Those are when you hear about the back in the days, the attendings on the golf course and the residents manning the situation, you know, um, you know, at home, there were not even rules around attesting or attending signing notes, you know? Um, and so, so residency has come a long way, you know, do we need to go further? Yes, but it has definitely come a long way. And so there has been a sea change uh, as the, as it should. But in terms of how did we get here, we got here because this, of what, how we started. Why are we not like the airline industry? Um, this is very important. The reason we're not like the airline industry is because the pilots have skin in the game. And so, um, you know, when, and it's also a media extravaganza when a plane goes down, right? I mean, it's a it's a very clear never event when a plane disappears or goes down. Um, you know, it's national news on cable TV multiple times, um, FAA looking around. So, so the airline industry actually is very interesting culturally because it didn't start out like that either. When, uh, commercial airlines started, where did you get pilots? You got them from the military and you pulled them in from the military. But when you took military pilots, military pilots 
are created for speed and courage, right? Because you're going to go on, on a, you know, on a mission, you, you're going to go in and get out and you're going to be brave, you know, and you're going to take that risk that you need to. That type of pilot mentality did not work well at all with commercial aviation where you, they needed a team and you needed a co-pilot and potentially listen to anybody, you know, in the cabin to understand, have a debrief or a huddle. So the, um, airline industry went through several, you know, interventions to get to where they are today to be safe, um, that really focus on flattening the hierarchy, improving team communication, use of simulation, deliberate practice, and regulation of work hours, as well as fitness for duty assessments. So pilots routinely have to make sure they're fit for duty by filling out checklists that they're not sick and they're safe and they, they're ready to, to fly the plane. We are behind behind um, that industry. We are behind in the safety movement. So safety came to us later. Um, and now some of the things you're seeing from uh, pilots like simulation and um, deliberate practice are, are being used. Um, and uh, measuring outcomes, you know, fanatic measuring of outcomes, as well as those debriefs and communication flattening the hierarchy. And we're also late in terms of work hour regulation on what's called fitness for duty. And so the future really is in thinking about fitness for duty assessment. I can think of no other time than the pandemic where that has become so important because the same issues around whether or not you're too sleepy to work are related to whether you're too sick to work. In the earlier SARS epidemics, you know, we had nosocomial transmission that was documented in the literature of physician trainees coming to work sick, you know, and staff because of this high, you know, misplaced moral obligation on the professionalism of working um, over taking care of yourself, even when it puts patients and others at risk. Um, now, fortunately, with the COVID pandemic, with rules and regulations and the, you saw these fitness for duty assessments, like people were encouraged to gather and be like, is anyone sick? Anyone have symptoms? Okay, you go get your test. Um, that's the type of culture that's going to be needed in medicine for us to say, okay, you know, you know, you, you know, I think you're too tired to work. Why don't you go take a nap? We'll cover for you for a while. Or, you know what, let's call in jeopardy because, you know, you've exceeded your limit. We are not there yet. We, the best we can get right now is sort of those blanket mandates for hours you know, 80 hours, you know, 24 hours for a shift, or here's your night shift, X number of hours for time off. What we really need to be doing is thinking about a model where people feel safe to say they're not fit to work so that they can remove themselves and that systems are in place to mitigate that. Um, and unfortunately, that's incredibly challenging right now because of a variety of issues, but most importantly, because of our fixed number of our workforce. And, um, you know, and and so, you know, we get into these cycles, right? Because we, we don't have enough residents to cover the patients. We, do we have hospitalists? Do we have advanced practice providers? And so you see a lot of deck shifting. We're moving deck chairs around to try to cover what we can when sometimes we might need to say, okay, maybe we need an investment of human capital here in, um, in our teaching hospitals to help bring this up to speed, you know? If you had a magic wand and you got to build a new way of training medical trainees and you got to put sleep and wellness at the top, which knowing you, I think that's, that's what you would do. How would you redesign? I mean, is the 80 hour work week? I mean, you say that out loud, you say that to people not in medicine and my non-medicine friends are like, that is insane. Like why? <laughs> yeah, actually I can so, so when I published my first study about um, resident duty hours, I got a handwritten note from Bertrand Bell, who is the leader of the Bell Commission in New York, which regulated the first resident duty hours from the Libby Zion case, uh, the famous Libby Zion case in in New York. Um, that you know that that sort of was the 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 sentinel event that that led to the first restrictions of resident duty hours in New York prior to the nationwide implementation. So he led the commission, and he wrote a note to me, and in his note he said. 
you know, um, you know, dear Dr. Aurora, thank you for your work. And, you know, he, he thanked me for the work and he said, I wanted to give you the background on the resident, you know, 80 hour work week, uh, you know, because I had, you know, cited that there wasn't a lot of evidence for it. And he said, the way we came up with the 80 hour work week was several of us sat around the table and we thought, okay, well, if everybody is working on this schedule, this sounds right. And if you add that up, oh, mysteriously, that's 80. And so he, (laughs) he himself admitted that, you know, there was, it was more of a consensus process, low level of evidence, if you, if you will. And so again, you know, um, having some, this is not uncommon with policy, right? I mean, he was bold, he put the policy out there, but he had to be informed by something where we all know in policy, you have to respect what will the median person in your field expect, you know? And so this was where he thought he could get the buy-in, which was the 80 hours, like, because of this consensus of experts around his table. And so then again, you know, if you look at it now, you're like, okay, we've got the Halstead, we've got that 80 hour modification. So this is what we're inheriting. I would say one of the things we really need to think about, and it's not just around sleep and and hours, it's around also scope of practice and and working to the top of your license. Um, And so I would say one of the things to think about is, you know, how do you build in the learning, you know, making sure the environment is conducive to learning as well as making sure that residents are um, learning and delivering care the best they can um, under supervision, you know, getting the feedback that they need, and also being respectful of the fact that they are people as well. Having said that, I am also sensitive to one key thing, which is that um, the reality of medical practice today in many areas is around sleep disturbed sleep and around, you know, um, around not having those well-being supports that some of our residents have currently. And so, so we can't, you know, really about, it's about moving the field as opposed to moving just training. And so I would say we've got to move training. We've also got to move the field. Otherwise, you'll just end up with this backlash from the faculty being like, well, that's great that the residents all have this, you know, lovely schedule. But what about when you're a fellow or faculty? What then? So so my thought is, you know, the field has to move together. Um, We've got to really first prioritize in a resident schedule. What are those activities that matter most? And then also think about, you know, what is it? You know, how, how do you also figure out using the system that you have, what makes sense to cover the patient care that's needed? And so leveraging only residents for patient care is not going to cut it in today's current environment. And so how do we how do we build in those supports, whether it be advanced practice providers, hospitalists, other clinicians, teamwork? You know, we've got to have everybody working at the top of their license. And I would say one of the top burdens I hear from residents today um, is often doing low level um, work that doesn't relate to their learning or to their practice that could be done by somebody else. And that's actually an opportunity for for jobs in, in a community. And so what are those other jobs that could support? Now, of course, the challenge is this requires an infusion of money and um, investment that not only would have to be made on the part of you know, hospitals, but also on the part of those that pay for care. And so that's really one of the biggest current policy challenges is how do we pay for training and how do we pay for care um, in teaching hospitals in particular? Wow. I mean, these are just, this is so wonderful to have you on. I just want to highlight a couple of things with some recent examples. I love what you're saying about we can't just focus on the medical trainee and we have to look at the whole system. And I was actually having lunch with one of my trauma surgeon friends. And I said, hey, you know, how much do you, on a bad week, tell me your bad week, how many hours you think you work? And she said, mm, probably 120. Yeah, exactly. I, I get what you're saying that if if we create this, you know, kumbaya, everything's awesome during residency, 40 or 60 hour work week, and then they're expected to go out and work 120 hours how would you do that if you didn't have that experience in residency? Right, you'd be expecting, you you would be setting up people to fail. And actually I would say um, currently there's some 
concerned that the focus with medical students, you know, are they set up for currently working in our current environment? You know, because I, I would say, ob- obviously, the groups that are most focused on well-being and, you know, in fact, teach me about well-being are, are the most junior people in our system. And we not only have to learn from them and help help, you know, help them, you know, get through their experiences it, as learners, but we also have to deliver on on the expectation of what work is like. And so, um, you know, while th- it's an academic exercise for us to think about how what it should be, there's the reality of the fact that it's a surge day in our ER and there's patients to be admitted as a community with our focus on health equity, you know, go to meet our patients with the resources that we have today. Um, and so, you know, one question is, you know, are we equipped to to do what we need to do for the patients? I always have to think about the patients at the, at the center. And so if you start with that, if you start with not only what do the residents and students need, but what do the patients need, right? Then there's going to be this, well, what's this middle ground, right, where where you support that learning environment with the other folks that are going to help this system survive, you know? Yeah. And going back to what you were saying about getting people to work at the top of their license, I think that is such an important concept because that's an innovative solution to what we're having. And I think back to those horrible ICU months where I was just completely drained working these 30 hour shifts and so much of my time I mean I remember this this MICU note was a six page word document that I'd have to write there was like no auto populating you know their social history pulling in stuff from their medical record and I mean that was a ridiculous use of my time a ridiculous use of my time looking back on it and and what you're saying is you know, if I could have gotten 45 minutes of shut eye <laughs> at some point in that 30 hours, it would have made a huge difference. And and it honestly makes me physically ill when I think back to that because that hospital was about 10 or 12 miles north of where I live. And, you know, I live in Southern California. The traffic's terrible. And I definitely fell asleep behind the wheel. And I just think about how awful that is. It's so awful. To address your first point, I always say the goal is not to make people work harder, it's to make them work smarter. And um and in, in this situation, especially with uh, with um, you know, with residents and faculty, all all clinicians in our in our practice, you know, there's stupid things about the EHR that can be fixed. So we have a program we created called What to Fix to crowdsource those fixes so that we can make people work smarter, especially as they work from home and work remotely, you know, how can we take out any of the administrative burdens that they face? And similarly, we, you know, we've hired some patient care navigators um, to help with discharge. You know, we, we really need to expedite discharge. And if everything falls on that intern to schedule appointments in the community, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't need an MD to schedule an appointment. And in fact, the person who might be most equipped to schedule that appointment in the community is one of our staff who lives in the community. Does, does that make sense? And so, um, and so we are working very hard to figure out how to offload some of those tasks to other folks to not only improve the learning environment, but also to improve the the speed and efficiency and quality of which we are treating our patients. And so there's win-wins there, you know? And similarly, there's a lot of waste in this system where if we can pull it out and either eliminate it altogether because it's administrative or um, help help support people with people who are experts at insurance or pharmacy to do the the things that need to be done regarding prior auth or et cetera, you could actually get really, really far. And, and that actually could help. And one other interesting note about the sleep issues is let's talk about paging, right? So there's so many things in a hospital where it's like renewal of Tylenol orders. That should never wake anyone up, right? That's a never event in my book, you know? And so we've done a lot of work to improve physician nurse communication communication and what's the what's in it for for the physicians it's the you're not going to get paged at night you're going to get fewer pages and we've looked at time motion studies every page right is you know three to five minutes out of your day and if you can reduce pages by you know on a surgery service you know you can reduce those pages through, through touch bases and better rounding and communication systems so the nurses have the plan of the care and they don't need to page nurses are not only satisfied 
the residents are satisfied, they actually get an hour back in their, you know, so you're more likely to get home on time, uh, more li likely to read or make it to conference. And the patients are satisfied because they say everybody's on the same page and they are able to leave the hospital faster. So here are just some examples of ways in which we can um, where, where I'm talking about re-engineering and redesigning the work so that it not only benefits the learner, but it also benefits the patient and the staff. I love all these systems issues, and it sounds like you work in such an innovative place, and I'm sure that has large part to do with, with your efforts. Thank you. Well, it's a great place, but we have we have problems like everybody else does, right? And so a lot of it is maintaining that sense of um of I can do better for all of us. We can all do better, you know, and so coming into it, and this is where you've got to, you know, burnout. When burnout becomes rampant, people don't see the solutions. And so that's the challenge. Yeah. And the other thing I want to hit on uh, before we move on to another topic, topic as we're closing out is what you've said over and over again is this is at the center of this is the patient. What I want our listeners to take away, and when you're talking to your friends outside of medicine as we're trying to make some of these changes and we need public buy-in for some of the changes that need to happen, is this is not about making, just about making the lives of doctors better. When you make the life of a doctor better, you're making the healthcare system better for patients. And I think that's where we need more alignment, that we are actually so interconnected and that the having a doctor, it, a patient should not have to sit there and worry as they're going, you know, into surgery. Has my surgeon, you know, have they had any sleep? This is a tricky one, right? Because again, it's access to care, right? So if you're, if you're in a um, car accident in Southern Illinois and you need brain surgery, you need that operation. And, you know, if somebody is being woken up, you're going to want them woken up in the middle of the night. You're not going to want to be, there is no other brain surgeon in that area. And so now you get the system issues, right? Which is the macro system is that we have maldistribution of specialists and a shortage in a lot of areas. Somebody's schedule um, of a specialty in an urban area may be very different than all of rural America. And I'm, I'm really sensitive to that because we often don't think about those areas where there is no coverage. There is nobody behind you to take call. It's just you, you know? And, um, and that's why a lot of young people, for a variety of reasons, don't want to go to those types of practices, many of them are choosing to affiliate with hospitals and bigger groups. You know, certainly a great example is, you know, um, Centers for Excellence for Cardiac Surgery or for Cardiac Catheterization. As you know, you know, it's people say it's better to get to the place that that has the has the resources that you need as opposed to the place that doesn't. And so you might in some times bypass a hospital to go to a place where you can get the, the necessary treatment. That may be very hard in certain areas, you know, of the country, but perhaps there's still treatment protocols that allow for those things to occur for a stabilization and then move. But but at the same time, we have to accept that in our current health system, we do not have the um, we currently do not have the right geographic distribution of what we need for our healthcare workforce. And we also are going to be suffering from critical shortages in areas. Um, and it's not just in primary care. There are there are going to be specialty shortages as well. And, um, and so it's going to require some thinking about our workforce strategically from a national level for that to occur. And I know AAMC and other groups are thinking about this, but unfortunately, it's a lot of it does fall on advocacy as well because, because it's investment. It's an investment in funding for training programs and for schools and for um, retaining people where they are. And so that's going to really require a lot of thought and investment and, and courage on the part of not only medicine, but also policymakers to really invest. So I want to make this practical for, let's, let's imagine that sleep deprived insert specialty, let's say surgery resident listening, or we have a lot of emergency medicine listeners or EM resident that's on their fifth 12 hour shift for the week. What are some practical strategies or what do you tell your residents about getting through? I mean, you've said you're essentially in, you're going to be in a sleep deprivated state. 
during residency. Yeah, I mean, they, when they study residents, they're on the scale with narcoleptics, so it's, it's bad. Um, so I often say, you know, um, a lot of it is listen to your body, you know, and try to ma- take advantage of your circadian rhythm when possible. So for the EM residents out there, and I know a lot of people, including surgery, are doing night floats. When you're on night medicine rotations, it's easy to you you got to stay up and um, you got to you the first night you go in see if you can get a nap before you go in. I'm a big proponent of naps. See if you can take that nap before you go in, and then get through your your um, shift and immediately go home and sleep and make everything dark. Use eye masks if you have to. Uh, whatever it is, put away your phone. Sign out your pager. Do not look up your patients and capitalize on that sleep debt because it's right there and you're at the tail end of that circadian you know nadir where you're you're still gonna be wanting to get sleep having said that you're not gonna people are are afraid they're like oh i'm gonna sleep through you know oftentimes you're gonna sleep for about three four hours you're gonna get up you're gonna eat lunch you know and then you'll have a little bit of time in the day then you can anchor your sleep as you go on a night rotation and take that nap right before you go in um and again you nadir around three you know that's like that afternoon nap the the barcelona siesta you know take that siesta and go for for a few hours um even an hour you know just something so that you have that before you go in and you will you will feel better um so so one is see what you know anchor your sleep try to sleep at the same time every day start a routine even as crazy as night float sounds or night night shift sound try your best to do that um switching back to days can be harder um that is actually i would say in my in my in my life, I think switching back to days is a little bit harder than switching to nights. We sort of like gravitate to the nights. Switching back to the days can be hard, but you do have to stay up. It, the key is to stay up and not fall asleep. And so now it's the reverse um, and do what you have to. Now, when you do have to stay up, strategic use of caffeine. So, um, you know, c- coffee and caffeine can be, it's potent, it's a medication. When you use a lot of it, you develop tolerance and that can be difficult because then it no longer works. And so I actually don't drink coffee after 12. I only have one cup of caffeinated coffee in the morning. And what it does is it helps with sleep inertia, that grogginess upon waking. And so when you have to go in in the middle of the night as a fellow, you know, get that coffee. It's going to help you with, um, you know, it, onset of action is about 15 to 30 minutes lasts for four hours. So it's going to help you to get in and be able to make those decisions. When you get woken up in the middle of the night as a fellow or as a resident, or if you're waking up, you're attending, keep in mind that decision making is impaired during that sleep inertia. And so this is when you call your attending and they're like, oh, you know, like, okay, sounds great. Like, Dane, did they really hear you? You know. You may need to call back again if they're coming in. You know, if you have to get on the road, have that coffee. Also, coffee can be very used, um, helpful, or caffeine can be helpful when you are going home after a shift. So, if you're really too tired to drive, get the coffee. And there's actually something called a caffeine nap, which has been studied, where because it takes a little bit of time for the um, caffeine to work you can then take a short 30 minute nap. So drink your coffee, 30 minute nap, and then that's called a caffeine nap, and then you're ready to go. And you not only have the benefit of the caffeine, you've got the benefit of the nap. Because the key is that caffeine does not replace sleep debt. It just helps with the sleep inertia. You're still gonna have the sleep debt. Now, people do not like doing this because you're like, oh, I don't wanna fall asleep in the call room and ugh, be here in the hospital for another, you know, what if I wake up the next day? That's never gonna happen. You set an alarm, you get up, but the the point is you'll be feel better for driving you know behind um you know behind the wheel or take a cab use rideshare get a friend um oftentimes friends are very very helpful they're going to see when you're tired you're not going to see when you're, you're tired so studies show that we're very bad at ad- assessing our own sleep deprivation um and micro sleeps you know that's what causes drowsy driving and so if you see a friend who is falling asleep in conference and is about to get behind the wheel you say hey man you should take a cab or you know why don't you you know wait here get let's grab some coffee take a nap you know or, and then i'll wake you up in 30 minutes so that you'll go home so um so i want to say this is about being a team and we protect each other as healthcare workers and that's going to be what what gets us through the day and so i often those are the three biggest things i i suggest which is 
um, sleep scheduling, optimizing your environment at home as, as much as possible. I mean, I, you know, it's very hard to have kids. Um, and the second is use caffeine strategically. Um, and the third is, you know, friends don't let friends drive drowsy. And that, that one is the probably the most important one when you're at work. I love that. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the tagline for the episode. Friends don't let friends drive drowsy. So this has been absolutely amazing. And I think as we round out every episode, we like to just ask if you have any challenges for our listeners. Um, Clearly, you gave a great roadmap for getting through sleep deprivation. But is there anything else that you would ask our listeners to do to improve their performance? and focusing in on sleep? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And I would just say life is so challenging as it is. Right now we're still in a pandemic. I am, you know, I, I'll be honest, like I, I'm having these doom scrolling, you know, tendencies again, you know, where it's very hard to not look at technology at night. Um, so we didn't talk about technology at night. And as healthcare workers, as physicians, we are linked to technology. We've got that pager, we've got that phone, we've got our, you know, our EHR on our phone, um, our email. And I would say my challenge to all of you is unplug at least at night. Um, so see if you can try to unplug at night so you can get better sleep. Um, we we had a Twitter challenge called the I Rest Challenge where people were challenging each other to literally, um, you know, put put away their phone and not be on social media, you know, after a certain hour at night. And and it worked. I mean, people were getting much better sleep. And so um, so that's my personal challenge to all of you. And then obviously um, we have big challenges ahead of us in medical education. And so when you're working with trainees, for those of you listening, you know, listen, understand, um, lead with empathy um, and highlight that, you know, what what we went through is not necessarily what worked and that's what we need to get get around our get our heads around it especially for our uh for the attendings out there listening wow i have to say this was a mind-blowing episode for me and to hear that a lot of how we structured resident work hours was inspired by somebody that was addicted to cocaine and then consensus guidelines of a bunch of guys around a table You know, it's just one of those things that this is why I love going back to history because we have to understand how we ended up here. And I think anybody listening to that would be like, that's a horrible way to make decisions, (laughs) but we have so much inertia. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I feel like we barely scratched the surface of this topic and I would love to have you back another time to deep dive more on sleep. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been great uh, to be here. And uh, I want to thank all the listeners as well. And feel free to reach out on Twitter. I'm at Future Docs. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right, good luck out there.